Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Just when you thought the situation with SLS was as bad as it could possibly get, Boeing now comes under scrutiny in the course of a lawsuit being filed by a Colorado-based contractor who claim that Boeing has stolen its intellectual property associated with the SLS rocket. And if you're an American taxpayer, you better hope that Boeing wins this case. Why? And in other news, Vulcan Centaur, after all kinds of delays and problems associated with the BE-4 engines, fires up those same engines on the pad at Cape Canaveral without a hitch. So now that a successful static fire and a successful test has taken place with Vulcan's primary propulsion system and everything else seems to be in order, with the possible exception of the Centaur upper stage, how long is it really going to be before Vulcan Centaur takes to the heavens and delivers its very important cargo to the surface of the moon? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. First of all, just want to make one thing perfectly clear. This last episode that I released about UAPs, about these revelations that have been happening in regards to a former UAP researcher, it has been ridiculously successful. Over 160,000 views at the time of this recording, over 12,000 likes, and we've added over 2,000 new subscribers. Welcome to our channel, and thanks very much. I hope you enjoy the other content that we have for you. So a couple of things have been made clear to me as a result of this video. Number one, UAP and alien content seems to be very popular. This is my third straight, very successful UAP. UAP video, so I'm going to be releasing one or two of these videos per month, although no more than that, because this is a channel dedicated mostly to spaceflight. However, another thing became very clear as I released that video and as it hit YouTube, the more likes we get on a video, the more successful it's going to be. It's for the first time I really asked for likes for a particular number of likes and actually got three times as many likes as I asked for. So thanks very much. And it's one of the reasons that the video was so successful. So please like this video as well. Let's move on to the news today. Six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition, and liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. During this historic liftoff, many people, including myself, came to the conclusion or at least dared to hope that the worst of SLS's problems were behind us. Now that the rocket had proven itself so magnificently, and now that Orion had performed so well also, it seemed that future missions to the moon were unavoidable, that Artemis II would be taking place in very short order, and that assuming that Starship could get off the ground and be become operational soon, human beings would be returning to the surface of the moon very soon as well. Indeed, for a while it appeared that Starship was going to be the main sticking point in returning humans to the moon. However, that may not be the case. This may be the only time that we ever see SLS take flight, simply because the damn thing is becoming so absurdly expensive. Recently, of course, I released a story about how the NASA OIG had reported that SLS was going another $6 billion over budget, mostly because of the fact that Aerojet Rocketdyne was charging such an absurd amount for new RS-25 engines, engines that it should have mastered a long time ago and reduced the cost on significantly, but that doesn't seem to be the case. That's a lot of extra money being piled onto the American taxpayer, and now we have a loss 
lawsuit from a Colorado-based company, Wilson Aerospace. And the most ridiculous thing of all about this, they're suing over wrenches, something called the Fluid Fitting Torque Device 3, which Wilson developed and Boeing said they needed in order to attach the RS-25 engines to the SLS core stage. The lawsuit was filed in a U.S. district court in Seattle, where Boeing was originally based, and it alleges that Boeing reached out to Wilson in March of 2014 after learning that the company had the exact tool, the special torque device that is, which was necessary to install high torque fittings and nuts in tightly confined spaces. In other words, the tightly confined spaces around the RS-25 engines, where they are mated to the core stage with its propellant and iron oxidizer tanks. That's one example of tight spaces where this tool proved to be extremely effective. So according to the plaintiffs, Boeing arranged for a live demonstration of Wilson's torque device, during which time participants could handle and operate it to verify the tool's capabilities and performance. However, what they didn't realize, quote, is that they later learned that at least seven of those in attendance for the live presentation were external to Boeing and were at at the time, employees of Wilson's direct competitors. The fact was concealed from Wilson, who was deceived by Boeing and the bogus Boeing employees into giving the presentation by falsely suggesting to Wilson that everyone was a Boeing employee. The lawsuit goes on to claim that Boeing subsequently used information from this demonstration, as well as proprietary drawings and designs, to work with Wilson's competitors to develop a cheaper solution, and that, quote, Boeing concealed these facts from Wilson as part of its scheme to defraud Wilson and to transmit Wilson's IP to direct competitors, unquote. That is a very serious charge, and if true, Wilson is very likely to get a substantial substantial settlement out of Boeing. And it gets even worse than that. Some of the allegations in the lawsuit claim that Boeing has long been engaged in efforts to steal intellectual property from suppliers and contractors and then use its shield of work with NASA and the U.S. Department of Defense to protect itself from these activities. That, again, a very serious charge. But the charges get even worse than that. According to the lawsuit, quote, Boeing's mismatched tool tools of inferior quality were a cause of the leaks experienced in the SLS projects. Remember them? And likely caused leaks in equipment of Boeing's joint venture partners and licensees, which Discovery will uncover, unquote. Very serious charges indeed, and if Boeing were to lose this lawsuit, or just settle for a substantial amount of money, well, that cost is very likely to get passed on to the American taxpayer. How so? Well, that's been the case with almost everything in this project. Boeing, of course, cannot directly charge the American taxpayers or NASA for this settlement, but they can manipulate the cost of the contract in order to cover these costs with other fees and services, as they have done a number of times in the past. Indeed, because this is a cost-plus contract, Boeing can essentially increase the price for just about any piece of equipment or services provided on this rocket and then, insanely enough, receive a bonus for doing so. That has been the modus operandi on this contract from the beginning. So what is likely to happen here? Well, once again, I'm kind of hoping that Boeing wins this case because if they don't, the price of SLS is going to increase even further and the chance of Artemis being canceled increases as well. Although, honestly, if I were making a judgment according to what is right, Wilson Aerospace should get their settlement if their claims are indeed true. Let's get on to better news. On June 7th, less than two days ago, Vulcan Centaur in ULA carried out a static fire, or something called a flight readiness firing, as far as ULA is concerned, on the BE-4 engines. These troubled engines that have delayed this rocket so many times seem to have performed fantastically. The engine start sequence started 
started at T minus 4.88 seconds and they throttled up to their target level for two seconds before shutting down, concluding a six second test. This is a test very similar to the types of static fires that SpaceX does prior to launch. Everything appears to have been nominal and it was the last major milestone on the path to launch, according to Tori Bruno. So now that this is behind ULA, it would seem that Vulcan Centaur should be lifting off extremely soon. However, according to my contacts at Astrobotic, the Peregrine Lunar Lander has not yet been delivered to ULA. It hasn't even been shipped yet. That being the case, then, I can't imagine that Vulcan Centaur can lift off in anything less than a month and probably significantly longer than that. The Peregrine Lander is ready to ship and has already been been tested inside a mock-up of Vulcan Centaur's fairing, so integration should be a relatively simple process, but it will take at least a week and probably longer to ship the Peregrine down to the Cape once they get the notification to do so, and then at least three weeks and probably longer to integrate the payload into Vulcan Centaur's fairing. In my opinion, ULA will be hard-pressed to get Vulcan off the ground before the end of July, and it's very likely that the launch will be delayed until August at least, assuming everything else goes smoothly. I'll keep you guys up to date on how things are progressing, because quite literally, my ass is on the line. And for those of you who don't know what that means, check out my 100k challenge videos. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space!